Naruhisa Arakawa is a name I've only recently become familiar with. But much like Yasuko Kobayashi, who I talked about quite a bit in my Ryuki and Dragonite video, there's a good chance that he wrote one of your favorite toku shows. Hello everyone. Originally I was only planning to have two spin-off series, but this topic doesn't really fit into either Across the Grid or Morphin Mythos. So I've decided to start a third subseries, which I'm going to call Under the Spandex. The purpose of this show is specifically to talk about writers, directors, and other technical staff that work behind the scenes to make the toku that we love possible. Arakawa's earliest writing credit is for one episode of Kamen Rider Black. He then wrote episodes of Sentai from Jetman all the way up to Mega Ranger. His first job as a head writer was Kamen Rider Kuga. If you travel to Japan, China, and South Korea, you'll find the toy aisles dominated by Ultraman and Kamen Rider. If you want Sentai merchandise, you're going to have to hunt for it. This wasn't always the case. Kamen Rider was cancelled in 1989 after Black RX due to poor ratings and the increasing popularity of Super Sentai and Metal Heroes. It's ironic that Kamen Rider is still going strong more than 20 years after Kuga revived it, while Metal Heroes disappeared and Sentai is still trying to recapture its former glory. But for me, the biggest irony is that Kuga is a great show because of Arakawa's previous experience writing for Sentai. Yusuke Gadai is not a complicated character. His motivation and arc are simple and straightforward. But people who've seen Kuga consistently praise him as one of their favorites, and I personally think a lot of this comes down to his relationships with other characters. Modern Writer pretty frequently has forgettable side characters or characters that feel underutilized for no real reason. I kid you not that for over a year, I forgot that Wizard's Apprentice sidekick existed. Just completely forgot about him until I rewatched the first two episodes on Toei's YouTube channel. Despite having only one writer, all of Kuga's side characters feel like they matter. When I first saw Jean, the foreign college student, I figured he wouldn't be around much, but then he ends up working with Anakita and becomes an important part of her story. And they start dating, I think? Disneyland. Kuga has a number of things it heavily implies without outright confirming. By himself, Gadai is one of the least interesting writers, but his personality is so expertly crafted into the show as a whole. Kuga's main theme is about how the pursuit of power ultimately corrupts. While the Grongi are a vicious race that kill for fun and to climb their social ladder, what is the line between them and humanity? As humans continually develop stronger weapons to stop them, do we become more like them? A character like Gadai fits perfectly into a story like that. As he becomes stronger as Kuga, his friends and loved ones worry about him losing himself and that he will sacrifice his own smile while protecting the smiles of others. Gadai changes the people around him and reminds them that you shouldn't pursue power for your own self-interest. Kuga is a joy to watch because it's a true ensemble cast. Yeah, there's only one writer, but I felt that Gadai and his growing support structure had much more interesting interactions than a lot of the multi-writer casts we've gotten in recent years. Arakawa understands that you don't necessarily need deep, complex characters for a series like Kamen Rider and Sentai to work. What you really need is interesting dynamics and relationships. It's strange to me that the man who brought back Kamen Rider for the modern era and wrote the show that is still the gold standard for many fans was never the head writer for Kamen Rider again. In fact, after Kuga, he's only written two episodes of Kamen Rider Double, which involved the two dancers in Heaven's Tornado. While Arakawa never revolutionized Sentai in the same way that he did Kamen Rider, the shows that he was the head writer for are generally very well regarded by fans. Kira Major is one of the only Sentai in recent years that hasn't divided the adult fanbase. For this essay, we're going to mainly focus on the Sentai that Arakawa was the head writer for. These are Abba Ranger, Decker Ranger, Go Kaiger, and as previously mentioned, Kira Major. Before some of you nerds point out Akiba Ranger, yes, I know. I'll get to it. While I haven't finished Opera Ranger, I've seen enough of it to get the general feel of it. 
I have seen all the other Sentai Arakawa has been the head writer for in their entirety. While Arakawa is known for writing lighthearted and fun material, you can still find some biting commentary in his work. One common theme that appears in his shows is how parents and parent figures can fail children by carelessly breaking promises and being too self-centered. Kuga has an Akita, a single mother who is also one of the police force's most talented scientists. Abba Ranger has Ryoga and Mai. Ryoga's relationship with his niece is damaged when he becomes an Abba Ranger and he can't devote as much time to being her guardian. Kira Major also has the episode Toys, in which a lonely boy is alone at home while his mother goes to work. What's interesting about these storylines is that Arakawa's commentary isn't condemning single parents for working a lot. What he condemns is single parents lying to their kids for their own convenience. Arakawa seems to believe that broken promises are some of the most hurtful things a child can experience. With Anakita and Kuga, her redemption doesn't come from her quitting her job or anything like that. It comes from her finally being honest with her son that she just isn't always going to be there, but that she is going to find something they can do together and work harder to be with him when she does have time. Likewise, in Kira Major, the resolution of the episode is that the kid tells his mother that her absence makes him sad, but that maybe he'll be okay if she gives him a big hug before she leaves. Parents need to be honest and communicate with their child. Lies and hasty promises only hurt everyone in the end. He also likes to criticize how institutions like school and work destroy people. There's a recurring character in Kuga who is Gadai's old teacher. There's an arc where one of his students runs away to Tokyo to find an old neighborhood he used to visit when he was younger. He's distraught to find that places that he remembers fondly are now gone, and that people who worked in shops he used to visit don't work there anymore. He's a middle schooler going through a midlife crisis. Back in 2000, Arakawa wrote an episode of Kamen Rider about how society forces children to grow up too fast. The reason the boy is upset is because he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And the moral of the story is, yeah, of course you don't know what to do with your life. You're a kid. It's okay to worry about things. You don't need to have everything figured out yet. Abba Ranger has an episode where the villains open up a new cram school and give the students psychic powers to mind control them and use their intelligence to... Yeah, this one is uh, not a subtle commentary on how making students endlessly study and push themselves to get the best grades by any means possible destroys their souls. One of Arakawa's other accomplishments was by expanding the audience of both Kamen Rider and Tokusatsu in general. There's a term that you might be familiar with if you're a big Kamen Rider fan called the Odagiri Effect. It is named after Joe Odagiri, the actor who played Yusuke Gadai in Kuga. Toei found that a lot of women were watching Kuga, and one of the reasons was that the main character was played by an attractive young man. This greatly affected the casting for future Kamen Riders. I'd say it goes a bit deeper than that. Arakawa is consistently pretty good at writing female characters. It's very rare that any of his female side characters or heroines can simply be described as the girl. Yeah, Decker Ranger's Umeko comes close, but I think that oversimplifies her. Some of the most beloved female Sentai members, such as Jasmine and Luca, come from his shows. Senna and Sayo from Kira Major quickly became fan favorites, even if I do have some issues with most of Sayo's focus episodes either being shared with other characters or just outright hijacked and turned into an important plot episode. Okay, so he's not perfect, but he's still consistently good. Even before becoming a head writer, he often wrote episodes in the series which focused on one of the female characters, such as the Zhu Ranger episode where Mei fights Lamy in various outfits, or some of the Zanet focus episodes in Car Ranger. He's also one of the only writers that I think knows how to do sentient mecha. Yeah, everyone loves Tiramigo and Ryu Soldier, but does anyone actually care about any of the other mecha and their relationships to the other teammates? In Kyoryuger, I don't remember caring about the relationships of any of the Kyoryugers with their Voltasaurs outside of Gabutira and Daigo. Meanwhile, in Abba Ranger, I love the dynamics between the dinosaurs and their Abba Ranger partners. And even though Kira Major doesn't have a brutal scene of all the stones dying like Ju Ranger has with the Guardian Beasts, 
I found myself generally more concerned about the well-being of the Kira Maystones because they all have their own defined dynamics with their Kira Major partners. When it comes to Sentai, probably Arakawa's most important and influential work is Gokaiger. Gokaiger is undeniably one of the most popular Sentai of the past decade, and for better or for worse, it set the gold standard for how to do an anniversary season. I've seen criticism that without the Ranger Key gimmick or the veteran Sentai appearances, there is not much substance to the series with the characters being simple, and there is truth in that, but I do think that the criticism overlooks one of Gokaiger's greatest strengths, which is its simple and straightforward characters. I mentioned before how Godai from Kuga by himself is a bit of a bland character, but he becomes endearing and engaging through his interactions with the other characters. This works for Gokaiger as well. Let's take Luka for example. On her own, she's a thief who is defined mostly by greed. But her interactions with all the other characters is what makes her more interesting. Marvelous is her bro. Joe is a distant friend that she's not particularly close to, but she still respects his strength. Ahim is her little sister that she will not let anyone hurt. And then Doc is her little brother that she always teases and makes fun of. I'm not going to do this for all the Gokaijers, but the point is that while they are all simple and one-dimensional characters, their sincere interactions and exchanges is what has made toku audiences around the world love them. Please let the 10-year anniversary movie be good, please. Honestly, you could strip away the anniversary aspect of Gokaiger and put these characters together in a different premise and it would still be a great show. The reason Gokaiger works so well as an anniversary season is because Arakawa understands what makes Sentai great. He understands it so well, he was even able to write a parody of it. After being responsible for the infinite money machine that is Gokaiger, Arakawa was the head writer for Akiba Ranger, which premiered the following year, and is one of the greatest parodies in existence. The show follows a group of three otaku living in Tokyo. The name Akiba Ranger is taken from Akihabara, a district in Tokyo that's become famous for catering to nerd culture. It starts off sad and depressing. Our three leads are chosen to be an unofficial sentai, fighting monsters that only exist as delusions in their heads. For the first half of the show, the plot more or less goes exactly as you'd expect. A main bad guy is introduced, and the delusions start to break out into the main world. And everything gets more serious. And then the show gets really weird. I won't spoil it because Akiba Ranger deserves its own video in the future. But it breaks the fourth wall hard and is even more insane than Car Ranger's mystical car constellation magic. If Gokaiger is a celebration of Sentai, Akiba Ranger is a celebration of its fans, warts and all. In the first season during the end credits, a narration from one of the characters would play detailing embarrassing situations. There's one for Akiba Red where he talks about a time he came across an old middle school friend. He discovers that he and his friend bought the same Sentai Deluxe robot. But whereas he bought the toy for himself, his friend bought it for his young son. For whatever reason, this end credit narration is one of the moments from the show that hit me the hardest and still sticks with me years after I finished watching it. Despite Akiba Red's obvious personality flaws, he's written as a relatable character, doing his best just to get through life like everyone else. There's a notable episode that features Akiba Yellow. It's her birthday and her mother visits. Her mother joins in the delusion and helps the team fight. It's revealed that Akiba Yellow's mother died a long time ago, and that they had been in the delusion since the beginning of the visit. And I think that sums up Akiba Ranger and its portrayal of fandom best. While it's sad and depressing at times, there's real hard passion and earnestness underneath that deserves respect. Okay, so the episode with Akiba Yellow's mom was written by Junko Komura and not Arakawa. Who is Junko Komura? Well, she worked on a number of Sentai, including Gokaiger, and is the head writer for this year's anniversary Sentai, Zenkaiger. She is definitely someone I'm thinking about doing an episode on if I decide to do a second episode in this series. Well, moving on. At the time of this video, Arakawa's most recent gig as a head writer was for the 2020-2021 Sentai, Kira Major. And just like with Gokaiger, Arakawa shows that he understands what makes Sentai special. At first glance, Kira Major is a lighthearted show about a group of talented people using their gifts to bring happiness to others. But 
It wouldn't be an Arakawa work without some biting social commentary. Abba Ranger and Decker Ranger both have our Sentai use their courage and willpower to push themselves past their limits. This is a pretty common trope in tokusatsu that's been around since the Showa era. By the time we get to Kira Major, though, Arakawa seems to be as disgusted by this as he was about how schools and other institutions treated children. Before we can talk more about that, though, we need to talk a bit about Kadoshi. What is Kadoshi? It's a term that was coined in the 80s to describe people who died of overwork. The first case of this is actually in the 70s. At the time, most of Kadoshi's victims were older men with pre-existing health conditions that were made worse with stress. The term became popularized in the 80s as young men in their prime started to die from stress-related health issues. The term is also used to describe people who commit suicide as a result from stress at work. In 2011, there was a peak of Kadoshi-related suicides and deaths. Over 2,000 people died either by their own hands or by exhaustion as a result of their jobs. In 2013, journalist Miwasado died of heart failure at the age of 31. If you do a Google search for her, you'll find that most of the articles about her death are dated 2017. That's because even though she died in 2013, the information about the time leading up to her death wasn't compiled and released to the public until 2017, turning her story into international news. Sado had been covering the election of Japan's upper house. During the month of her death, she had logged in over 159 hours of overtime and had only taken two days off work that entire month. Kira Major aired in 2020, and would have been entering pre-production and filming in 2019, and Arakawa probably would have had to start coming up with the concept and premise sometime in 2018. While the number of deaths from Kadoshi had overall decreased since 2011, there was a rise between the years of 2016 and 2018. It's hard not to think that the state of Japan's working environment wasn't on Arakawa's mind when he created the character Yodana. Yodana's job is the emperor's secretary. She's not his general or commander, she's the secretary. Her weapon of choice is a riding crop, which she can turn into a whip. All of these things together seem very intentional. She uses her whip to increase the power of the monsters, but doing so reduces their lifespan. She literally works them to death. The Kira Majors are given the chance for a power-up to help them fight Yodana, but Juru refuses. He doesn't want to see his friends push themselves to death like Yodana's monsters do. We later get a flashback of Oradin, the old king, trying to increase the strength of a bow to hit more targets. He breaks the bow and realizes that you can't push things past their limit. Juru's solution to the problem is to create a power-up where the energy is split and traded among the team. Instead of one person bearing all the responsibility, the team works together to share the burden equally. There's also an imposed time limit, because consistently working excessive overtime provides little to no actual benefit. A lot of writers become more conservative as they get older, which is really disappointing. So when watching Kira Major, it was comforting to see Arakawa actually react to what was happening in the world around him and use his platform to try to spread a positive message and make a difference. So if you're watching a tokusatsu program and this name appears in the credits, it doesn't matter if it's the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, or the 2020s. You're in for a good time. That's all for now. Till next time, as always, may the power protect you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If there's a writer, director, producer, or other person of interest you would like me to do a video on in the future, feel free to leave a suggestion in the comments below. Special shout out to my friend Red Suika. When I needed to know which episodes specifically in a series were written by Arakawa, I reached out to them and they gave me a whole list in less than a day. They are very knowledgeable about behind the scenes toku stuff, so if you want to know more about that, feel free to give them a follow on Twitter.